just then. Um, okay, looks like we're we're getting ready to go. And you can oh, it looks like you can't see my cursor, and that's a shame. But uh, I guess I'll just have to describe everything. So yeah, um, thanks again, guys, for inviting me onto your uh, platform to give a talk. And um, obviously, my my name is Roy Kittrell. I'm a petroleum geologist here in in KL. Uh, I'm currently in Penang. Uh, because I'm doing a safari over here to look for trapdoor spiders, funnily enough. So uh, you can see I'm pretty interested in nature. And, um, you know, as Chan mentioned, uh, my usual photography is based around insects, spiders, and all that kind of stuff. But that's really just because that's the main thing I see. Um, I actually, I would say I was a naturalist, you know, someone who takes an interest in all of nature. In fact, my, my career is in geology. So uh, my first love was actually with rocks. So I'm, I'm literally interested in everything from the plants to insects to snakes, mammals, and everything I can, everything else I can get my hands on. And um, so, yeah, what this talk is really going to do is just me kind of focusing on all the reptile, amphibians, and of course, pit vipers and snakes that I've found uh, over the years. Um, let's go to the first slide. So to kind of explain where I'm coming from, I have to go all the way back to when I was a kid, and um, I think some of my first memories are just going out in the back garden and uh, looking at like frogs and insects and anything else I could find. I even have a memory of my dad waking me up at like, you know, 9 p.m. and saying, Roy, quick, I just found a frog on the driveway. So, you know, like Ooh. I was always uh, from from as little as I can remember, I was always interested in this kind of stuff. In fact, one thing about this picture that's kind of interesting is I think there's a compass around my neck. And that might be a geological clinometer that my dad was lending to me for that trip. <laughs> so, so I was uh, I was indoctrinated at a very young age uh, to be into, into all this stuff. And, um, you know, I recently saw on Instagram, like one of these memes that kind of go around. And it was saying, uh, there's only two people in your life you need to impress. Uh, you, you at six years old and you at 60 years old. And I think on the left, I'm probably around six years old there. And over on the right, I'm at, I'm at, I'm about you know, 30 some odd, who knows. And uh, <laughs> I think six year, six year old me would be very impressed with what I'm doing nowadays. And uh, I'll be going into detail about what that frog is in a later slide. But yeah, this has been going on a really long time. And um, really over the over the last four years since I moved to Malaysia, uh, really got really took off. So it, it all started when I kind of moved to Malaysia. And uh, the first thing I did was I started diving. And as you do, you start diving and then you're like, hey, I should get a GoPro so I can take that down and take video. And then I got a GoPro, went down, took video and found out no one wants to watch my holiday videos. So I got more interested in taking still photography. And you can see there in my right hand, there's actually an Olympus TG5 camera. And I started doing diving trips specifically based around macro photography. And um, you can see on the right, I've got some pictures of a, a nudibranch and a crab. So you know, for about a year, I was really, really into diving photography. Um, but what, what happened is you can only go diving as you know, so many times a year, and then uh, you have to kind of fill the time in between dive trips with something. So what I what I decided was I was going to go into the jungle and start trying to like take pictures of insects as practice. And you can see on the top there, this bit of a joke, Roy the Dive Bro is my Instagram handle. And then I've kind of made a joke on the top, Roy the Dive Bro, but also Land Macro. Anyway, yeah, anyway. Um, so the, the whole idea of doing land-based photography was it was literally just gonna be me practicing for diving. Um, and you can see there, I'm using like a diving light on land uh, and just my TG5 in the jungle. And there's some example shots that I got using this equipment. So uh, there's a blunt headed snail eating snake on the top there. And then you can see a rhino frog on the bottom. And uh, so that's actually one of the only pictures I have of a rhino frog uh, with that horn on the top. They're quite an interesting animal. Um, you can actually get some pretty uh, decent pictures with using a TG5. So for anyone interested in like trying to get more images from the jungle and looking at nature photography, uh, the Olympus TG5 is actually a good place to start. And then using a diving light, I actually figured out that putting a soft cloth over the diving light uh, really gave a lot of a lot more diffusion and you can actually get a lot better images from it but I digress um, so just looking through my TG5 pictures some of the animals I've only seen with a TG5 so I only have these pictures of them so the first one is a saffron bellied frog which uh, Stephen and I found up in uh, Genting and um, it's a really beautiful looking um, like dark colored uh, spotted frog but then its underbelly has this amazing uh, yellow as you can see the saffron 
uh, color of its belly. So a uh, really beautiful little animal there. And then of course, uh, as I mentioned before, we, we saw a blunt headed slug eating snake, which I've only ever seen with my TG5, unfortunately. So I'm still looking for it. But I have another slug snake I'll be showing you in a little while, but uh, these guys are really amazing for like a lot of different reasons. Uh, the first one is that they specialize in eating slugs and snails, and they have specialized jaws that are adapted to digging into uh, the snail shell. Uh, but they also have a really cool habit where when they're provoked or when they're when they feel frightened, they roll up into a little cinnamon roll. So as you can see there, <laughs> there on the right, uh, we actually have like a little snake cinnamon roll. And uh, so this species is not only adorable, it also has a hilarious um, way of rolling up uh, to defend itself. Very, very, really wonderful species. So it was actually during one of these, it was actually my first night safari uh, when I went out with Stephen. Uh, Stephen Wong is um, here on the chat and he's my uh, safari guide for most of my trips in Malaysia. And um, it was on that trip, I was just holding my TG5 out with my diving light. And I got this picture of a oriental vine snake, Ayatula pressina. And, um, you know, nowadays I probably wouldn't think much of this image, but at the time I had never taken a single picture that I thought was this good. And I love the way that there was this black background and everything looked very abstract. And it was just literally all about the subject. And uh, I even used this as my desktop background for a while. And uh, I had people that, that were commenting on it, asking me where I, you know, if it was National Geographic. And so it gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But it gave me a lot of, com the, whole, the whole idea is I was a complete noob at, at all of this. And it gave me a lot of confidence to actually, I, I was actually very interested in land macro, not just as a, a way of practicing for uh, diving. It was actually like something I was interested in. And so this is the kind of progression uh, from, the GoPros all the way forward to the mirrorless system. So you can see here on the left, GoPro Hero, the GoPro 6, I think. I, I barely used it after I bought it. And then uh, the Olympus TG5. And then after about eight months of me, you know, using that, going on night safaris and watching hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos, trying to figure out which camera I needed, I finally settled on the Olympus EM5 uh, Mark III. So uh, I really, I'm really happy with this system and I can go into more detail about why later. So just to talk about my, my camera gear. So as I said, uh, I use the Olympus EM5 Mark III that has a micro four third sensor, uh, which a lot of uh, pro photographers would probably sniff at because it's not a full frame. But the fact is it's actually far better than a full frame for macro because my main interest is in like kind of insect photography. So um, for physical reasons, micro four thirds has a better depth of field uh, for macro photography. And it also has the added benefit for nature photography in that it's much lighter than a full frame camera. So you can get, you can really carry this thing around with a lot without having to, uh, let, you know, lug around a huge camera. And so for macro, a lot of my friends who uh, use full frame, uh, they need like a 90 mil lens to go along with it. But you can see here in the center, um, I'm using the 60 mil macro lens from uh, M Zuiko. It's also, it's just an Olympus lens. So just using this lens, I can get down to one-to-one -one magnification. And uh, this is also, as I mentioned, a 90 millimeter full frame equivalent. But doing smaller uh, detailed work, I can also add in a uh, filter on this right here. You can see this Raynox DCR250. Uh, that can take me all the way to one to, to 2.5 times magnification. So that means whatever size the creature is relative to my sensor, I can go to 2.5 times that uh, magnification. So uh, I can get really detailed. Um, just to give you an example, actually, uh, here on the left, you can see my finger pointing to a baby spider. This is actually uh, just a common Argiope spider. And then on the right, you can see what my camera is able to pick up using uh, just, just the 60 mil macro lens. So this is a great system uh, for looking at uh, macro photography and doing insects, insect work. So uh, nice. highly, highly recommend it. So now I'm going to have like an entire slide on lighting because I think for anyone watching this uh, that doesn't know a lot about photography, um, lighting is everything. You can take your camera, you can take your lenses, you can take all of the other equipment you have, and you can just throw it right out the window because I think lighting is the most important aspect of photography, regardless of what kind of photography you're doing. And in macro photography, it's all about getting uh, the softest light you can possibly get. So over here on the left, you can see a camera and it has a flash attached to it on the top. 
and then it has this long conical like thing attached to it and what that is is it's a diffuser and it has a sheet of white plastic over the front so when you fire your flash it's not strong it's kind of diffusing the light that's so it's called a diffuser and this brand is made by uh it's it's an mk diffuser it's made by marcus cam who is based in malaysia so this is the supplier uh for diffusers here um i for flashes i use a godox v350 um i think the most important thing about flashes is making sure you have the same brand as all the people you go herping with because if you look on the right, uh, we use this soft box. Uh, the one I use is made by Triopo. I'm sure there's other brands, but um, when you get to subjects that are larger, like um, kind of pit vipers or snakes or turtles, uh, switching to the soft box gives you incredibly good light for your subject, but you need a remote trigger for it. And if all of you in the same group have the same brand of remote, tr uh, remote trigger and flash, you can all use the same flash. So it just makes things a lot easier. Just to show you what that looks like in action, um, this is uh, Wayne Sinté, bless his little heart. He's like probably <laughs> twice as tall now. Um, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is only one year ago. This is only one year ago. And uh, you know, it's funny. I think this is actually literally the night that they declared the M the first MCO for COVID. So um, that was the oh, last Yes, time. it was. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. Yeah, that was the last time I saw Wayneson. Uh, and Wayneson Tay is an excellent photographer, by the way. Anyone listening, you should definitely check his uh, his work out. Uh, but here we're photographing a, um, let me think, it's a black-headed cat snake. Yes. And uh, so you can see on the top, uh, Wayneson is holding the diffuser up so we can get different directions of light. The diffuser is making the light extremely soft so you can get like really good detail work. And then Steven has a remote trigger on his camera, which allows him to fire the flash remotely. So. Um, you know, I, I always make the joke that uh, nature photography is a team sport. So here you can mm, really see uh, mm. how that how that plays into 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 effect. <laughs> so speaking about tools, one of the most important tools that I have uh, doing my work is iNaturalist.org. It's a website that allows you to upload pictures of literally any natural phenomena, so uh, plants, animals, insects, snakes, anything, and uh, people will go on and try and identify it for you and. It's a really amazing website because you can literally fly anywhere in the world and kind of like see what's there. You know, you can see what other people have seen. So for instance, you can go to Malaysia on this website and just list all of the snakes everyone's found. And uh, you can literally see like where everything is. You can see kind of like where they're generally found, like maybe they're around lakes or something, an incredibly powerful resource. And um, the thing that I find most funny about this, excuse me, is that lots of different communities kind of form in this so for instance i'm really in interested in spiders and i'm actually very good at like iding spiders on here now or I, i've definitely improved at this point um but you know you find out who the spider people are or you know there's there's like lizard people and they're really into that and then i found like three or four people who are like super good at identifying wasps for me and i found one guy who's amazing at identifying harvestmen so daddy long legs uh, which are actually quite tricky to uh, nail down IDs. But the mm. funniest thing for me is on iNaturalist, there's a snake community and there's a ton of people who are like super, super into IDing snakes. And every time I upload a snake picture to iNaturalist, it gets ID'd like immediately. You know, <laughs> like it takes like three minutes and like I've got like three IDs on it, you know, immediately. Mm. And the funniest thing about the snake community is that they argue more than any other community I've seen. <laughs> I know. Like, like some of the, like, I actually thought like, oh, I know I could go on here and like help people ID snakes. You know, I'm going to go find all the unidentified snakes and like help them out. And they were arguing if they were like, oh, we, we can only get this down to a genus level. We need to count how many scales it has on its nose before we can conclusively, I, you know, conclusively yeah. say whether it's, you know boyga cyanodon or something you know i mean they're like they're like really they're it's it's amazing to me like how incredibly picky they are it's it's really mm -hmm. funny but mm -hmm. yeah i really want to i want to encourage everyone to check this website out because it really is amazing and there's um, some really cool pictures on there um you know for me looking at spiders there's actually a ton of spiders that seem to be undescribed by science and so um, you know, I don't have to wait for some scientists to figure it out. Like I can actually go ahead and look at them. So yeah, I really encourage people to check this out. Oh, and I, I want to stress. Um, so as I mentioned before, a, a naturist or sorry, a naturalist 
is someone who appreciates and takes an academic interest in the natural world. But a naturist is someone who likes walking around naked in, in the forest. So just be careful about typos on this website. I'm not sure what else you know you might Google. Uh, <laughs> just be just be careful how you how you how you deal with that. Anyway, moving on, moving on. So what what kind of gear do you want to do? Do you want to like wear going herping? Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, you definitely need some good sturdy hiking boots. Um, I have some, you know, like really good hiking trousers. I actually thought they were really overpriced, but they've lasted like two and a half years of me trudging through the jungle. So I uh, actually ended up getting my money's worth. As you can see, I've got a backpack. I always carry water with me. Uh, my camera's uh, strapped around my, my neck, but I'll show you my new system in a second. Um, and I also recommend getting leech socks. And mm. I also recommend putting the leech socks on before you go into the jungle and see that there's leeches everywhere. Because the amount of times I've had to lean on Steven while I'm like taking my boots off and putting leech socks on, I can't even count. And um, there are leeches around. You'll never know if they're going to be there or not. Just put them on before you go into the jungle. And probably one of the most underrated pieces of equipment I have is my headband, which keeps all the sweat that is constantly pouring out from my forehead and keeps it out of my face because um, I think I was made for colder climates than Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of sweat. So yeah, as I mentioned, leech socks, definitely uh, highly recommended. And then I was going to show you my new system for carrying my camera around, which is a cotton carrier. And uh, this has really been a game changer for me because it leaves both my hands free to uh, walk around and steady myself as I'm climbing over under over and under tree trunks and, um, you know, fighting off, uh, you know, sun bears or God only knows what else we find out there. And um, yeah, I really recommend this system for getting around the jungle and very, very useful system. So just talk quick, quick talk about camera settings. I promise this is like one of the last boring slides and then we'll get to the animals. But um, yeah, I have my ISO set to the minimum. I think with some cameras like Sony's, you could definitely get um, uh, higher ISOs in there. And I've seen other people use higher ones, but I've experimented with Olympus and I really feel like um, you really need the minimum ISO and that gives you the best image quality possible. Um, my shutter speed is uh, 1 over 250, which is the highest my, my camera will go for a flash sync speed. So, um, you know, for, for my system, that's what I'm, what I'm using. Um, and then aperture and aperture, I gave a little diagram on the bottom for people who maybe aren't familiar with photography. Um, one thing, actually, for people who aren't familiar with photography, maybe I should explain. Um, photographers like to keep things as confusing as possible so that it keeps new people away from the hobby and it makes them feel really intelligent. So what we're looking at here is this, this kind of a diaphragm inside the lens opens and closes and lets more or less light in. And what you'll see is that there's an aperture number. So it's expressed as f2.8 or f13. And it can go up or down like you know f4, f5, f6, whatever. And basically, uh, f13 is a, a narrower aperture, Whereas f2.8 is a wider aperture. So it's completely backwards and makes no sense whatsoever, except to photographers. But um, I'll, I'll explain how this works in a minute, because this is the one thing that I really play around with. So um, in terms of macro photography, I usually have back button autofocus or back button focus set up for um, insects. But when I, when I see a herp subject, um, I'll switch to um, just regular auto autofocus. Um, yeah, group. For your flash photography, you really want to make sure you get the same brand as the rest of your group. And then, yeah, <laughs> I guess the last thing, nature uh, photography is a team sport. Roy, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, you mentioned that you use back button autofocus for macro and normal mm -hmm. autofocus for herbs. Uh, what's mm -hmm. the difference between back uh, button autofocus? Oh, okay, so when you're, you know, the, the smaller you go, the more your camera has to kind of move its internal parts, I guess, to focus on the subject. So what you really want to do when you're looking at an insect, for instance, is set it to the back button autofocus. So that what that means is like um, you're telling the camera to, to try to focus on the subject um, as long as you're holding down the back button. Mm -hmm. And then once you find that focus, you let go and it will keep that focus uh, no matter no matter how many pictures you take. Whereas and that's oh. really good because you don't want to once you have your focus set, you, you manually move your body back and forwards because uh, the focus plane is so small. Um, but then with a with something as big as a snake, for instance, um, you can just, you, you know, using normal autofocus is fine because the camera doesn't have to move that much. It's yeah. really just, um, it's really just, uh, 
you know, useful for people who are into photography. But yeah, I'm just putting it out there just so yeah. people know what my settings are, I guess. So it's like the difference between autofocus single mode and autofocus yeah. continuous. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's probably a better way of putting it. Yeah, and um, yeah, I dig into my menus every time I, I change it. I've just gotten, I'm, I now know where everything's hidden in like all the sub menus, but there yeah, you go. Yeah, we, uh, you were talking about gatekeeping. Every brand calls the yeah, aperture or autofocus or whatever technology is something else. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, yeah, metering as well, matrix metering, mm. spoon metering, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Roy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah just to because I think a lot of people watching this may not know a lot about photography uh, this is an example of like kind of what aperture is controlling so here's just a just a picture of a um, let me think this is a Bornean keeled pit viper uh, this is a male and this is like a really wide aperture so what happens is the wider your aperture the shallower oops sorry hang on whoops okay the shallower your depth of focus or your depth of sorry, your field of focus is. So you can see that only like, you know, his nostril is in focus and then everything else is very abstract and blurry. So here's an example of where you have a short aperture. So this is a poison rock frog. Um, so this F number is actually higher. So now it's, you know, whereas before it was like F2.8, this is like an F13 or F, F14 or something like that. So this poison rock frog, you can see it's all in focus, its eyes, its nostril, its leg, like mostly it's it's all in focus. So this is if you're doing like a textbook shot, if you just want to like show the whole creature exactly as it is, you want a higher F number. And then here's an example of the poison rock frog uh, with a lower F, F number. So this is like more art. This is how you get more kind of like arty, you know, abstract pictures of nature. And if I had to pick between the two, I'd like getting textbook pictures, but like my main love is always going to be uh, these kind of wider apertures. These, I like the, the abstract, you know, kind of in the moment photography like that's the hipster part of me speaking oh so now we're we're finally i think we're finally now out of the boring photography stuff um the really cool thing that i found out looking at this picture is i actually looked up the poison rock frog today because i wasn't really you know i didn't really research this subject too much but i actually found out it's called the poison rock frog uh, because it secretes a poison from its skin and it's not poisonous to humans as such but it's poisonous to other frogs so apparently if other frogs jump on this thing or, you know, touch it in some way, it will actually kill them. So that's what I kind of actually turned out to be quite an interesting frog. So that's the first, uh, finally, first, th first animal we're going to talk about. <laughs> and then, um, you know, for a lot of people maybe who don't know a lot about night safaris, um, you know, I thought I'd give you like a little clip to show you what it's like walking around uh, in the jungle at night. So here's just a little clip that I hope is going to play. So you can see Stephen leading us uh, through the jungle and we usually walk along footpaths. Oh, and I think Allison's there too. Ah. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is and just walking through the jungle and uh, we have head torches to kind of guide us through the, through the underbrush. And then uh, as you can see, I let Stephen walk ahead so that if there's any real danger, he'll usually spot it. So, First, uh, starting to get into some of the subjects now that you know how I've done all this stuff. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is this vertebral slug snake. Uh, so this was found up in Bukit Fraser, and uh, as you saw before, the blunt-headed slug snake. snake um, this is now the the kind of the more mountain version, and it has this amazing um, uh, spine running down its back and uh, these incredible red eyes that um, actually are that red. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of I used to have a habit of like pumping the color way too much in my pictures, but I think these are pretty pretty accurate for the most part. And then you can see here that um, it's got this really interesting jaw. So if you are, unfortunately you can't see my cursor, but if you look at it, it almost looks like it's smiling because uh, slug snakes, they're specialized in digging snails out of their shell. And so they've actually developed this jaw that's able to kind of like get in there and really dig it out. And they've, they've evolved uh, this special uh, jaw you can see here. And the interesting thing I found out about these guys uh, later on when I was doing some research is that um, before they, they came on the scene, most snails were dextral. So that means like their, their shells uh, spiral around in a clockwise fashion. So these snakes that, that preyed on these uh, snails um, evolved to have a jaw that worked in that direction. And what that meant is that um, every snail who had a sinistral uh, shell, so their shell would curve anti-clockwise, 
actually had like an like a natural defense against these snakes. So there started to be more of those snails coming out. And then like the the, the evolutionary moved towards a sinestral uh, shell. And then these snakes had to adapt for those as well. So there's actually a, a weird, uh, I think it's called like a red queens, a red queen race where two species are kind of like evolving one against each other at the same rate. So um, yeah, it's actually a really fascinating story behind these guys uh, and a really interesting snake. And uh, definitely check them out on YouTube because there's actually a couple of clips of them uh, hunting snails. And uh, one thing that's really funny is that they, they clearly don't need to be quick. <laughs> they really take their time with it, you know. And this is just a comparison between um, the mirrorless camera on the left and my TG5 shot on the right. So you can see that immediately there's like just a whole nother world of difference, but equally that the TG5 is still taking, you know, halfway decent shots. Certainly enough for an IV. Moving on to some other pit vipers here, we've got the Siamese pit viper. This is actually the first uh, pit viper I had ever seen in Malaysia. And this is a male, which you can see from this uh, stripe it's got going down its, uh, its body there. And I think, that, first of all, this was like the most green snake, I think, or green animal I think I'd ever seen in my life. You know, in real life, uh, it's really hard to describe like how vivid the color is on these things. I mean, they're absolutely stunning. And um, looking at the snake here, you can even see that between the scales, they actually have like kind of a blue skin. So it adds even more color. So this is what I would call kind of my my textbook shot. You know, I'd, I'd have a very short aperture. The whole snake is in focus. It's very good for IDs. And then you can see I even get bonus points because the tongue is out. That's Herpers really like to have pictures of snakes with the tongue out. Oh, yeah. And yes. so you have to kind of wait. It's, it's like you get bonus points or something. Anyway. Yeah. It's like achievement unlocked, yeah. Some herpers even care about how the tongue splits. If the yeah. if the tongue is sticking together, it's not so nice. If it's split and it looks like a Y, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And some people have preferences for an up flick versus a down flick. It's ridiculous. It, it's really crazy. Yeah. I, I think you need like a, the Brad Pitt of snakes for that kind of, um, you know, like a, you'd need a really well-behaved snake to get that kind of shot in, in Malaysia anyway. So... Like, like I was saying, this is my this is like my textbook shot, and I always want to get at least one of these full body. You can see the tail has this wonderful red patterning on it. And then moving here is like where I switched to a wide aperture. And I think this is where I started to realize like I really love this kind of more abstract picture. And I really love the way that the body is in the background, but its head is kind of poking out. I love that it's not composed in a way that normal photographers are no no the head needs to be the rule of thirds and oh my god all this stuff and it's like no i like i like that it's it's just kind of happened in the moment and it, so i really love uh, how this picture came out with the wide after now something interesting about this snake that i was looking at um when, when i started doing all my photo editing something i noticed that was really interesting is actually zooming in on its body and looking at these scales so if you actually zoom in and look at its scales, what was fascinating to me is that, um, you know, you would think, oh, you know, the snake needs like a red line and a, and a white line. So you would, you would think it would like have red scales and then white scales, and then the rest of its scales would be green, but that's not the case. And what was fascinating to me is seeing like, it almost looks like someone came and painted the snake. You know, it's like, it's like the colors like on top of the scales, regardless of um, and the patterns there, regardless of where the scales appear. So it was really fascinating to see that. And there's actually lots more examples of this um, in all the other pit vipers that I found and the other snakes I've seen. So I don't know, Stephen, uh, do you know, do you know any reason why, why that would be or how it's almost like the patterns like coming through the skin onto the scales or something, you know? Uh, yeah, there's no specific reason why the whole scale should be the same color. Uh, uh, and if you look closely, the amount of pigmentation is really quite fantastic and it variates as well. Mm -hmm. If you look mm -hmm. at the green scales, near the base of the green scales, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. see some bluish pigments and some blackish pigments uh, from the skin that's below it. So yeah. how much pig pigmentation it has on the scale really does vary yeah. vastly, vastly. Yeah, and there are some other snakes out there that are wonderfully camouflaged they're like brown and they're the color mm. of, you know, uh, dried leaves or light. Mm. And mm -hmm. the amount of pigmentation they have in the individual pigments is, uh, in the individual scales is quite incredible. Yeah, no, I, I, I think it's fascinating to me that the snake, it's almost like the snake clearly has an idea of exactly what color it's going to be and where, and the scales just kind of like, you know, deal with it. You know, it's like... yes. 
really fascinating to me. Yeah, it suddenly uh, looked painted on, yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, the next snake I was going to show is the dog tooth cat snake. So I have a joke uh, that I, I've probably told Stephen more times than I can count, but you know, whenever an animal has another animal in its name, it's like, it's a really cool animal. And if it has two other animals in its name, it's like, tw like three times cooler. So the dog tooth cat snake has three animals in its name. So that, that makes it a really interesting snake. And they're, they are, they're absolutely beautiful. So as Roy, you can see here, it's like, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah. I have a confession. Yeah. I stole your joke. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> started telling them on other night walks. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Well, the top, the dog tooth cat snake is is uh first of all it's it's a it's not a pit viper it's it's just um well it's a cat snake so you can see it's in that genus, um so the reason it, now okay I'm gonna try to remember yeah so there's the full body shot now here's the thing about the dog tooth cat snake let me just back up a second so when I looked it up it was like it's called a cat snake because oh snakes that like a cat snake has an eye like a cat it has like a vertical slit. And so that's why it's called a cat snake. And so all the cat snakes are called cat snakes because of that, this, they have an eye like a cat. But if you actually look at all the other snakes, they all have that eye. So I don't really understand what biologists were doing when they called it a cat snake, because as far as I can tell, every pit viper is a cat snake. So like, I don't, I, you know, obviously there's some special reason that by only biologists know that this would be called a cat snake, but there you go. Now, the other interesting thing, and let me show you the full body shot. Um, and by the way, let me just describe this snake for a second. So you'll notice it's really long. I mean, this looks like, you know, like maybe even a meter, you know, a meter and a half long. Cause I mean, it's, it's a, you know, extremely slender looking snake and it, it's quite, it's quite chunky. I mean, you know, it's, it's about the, the thickness of a, of a hose pipe or something. Um, but it's like that because it's arboreal and it likes to live in trees. So what it, what it does is it, it kind of grips onto branches and it uses this long length to strike at birds, lizards, and any other prey it can find. Um, but the other interesting thing that I was going to point out is that it's called the dog tooth cat snake because apparently it has teeth like a dog or it has some back teeth that are, are similar to the molars in a dog or something like that. So you know what I did? You know what I did, Stephen? I looked up a picture of the mouth of one of these things because I've never seen it. Uh -huh. And I don't know what kind of dogs biologists buy, but <laughs> that does not look anything like a dog's <laughs> tooth or a dog's mouth to me. So I have, so we, now we, now that we've established that it just has a cat, like a, like a, all snakes have those kinds of eyes. So there's nothing special about it. And its teeth are nothing like a dog's teeth. Uh, I think we I can now establish that this is the weirdest name for a snake I've ever seen, and um, I think biologists, you know, need to have a have a talk with themselves about their naming conventions. So anyway, um, yeah, moving along, moving along. <laughs> I thought it would be interesting to show you uh, another comparison between my mirrorless setup and the the flat, you know, the the diffusion. You can see actually, if you look in closely in its eye, you can see the uh, the diffusion, uh, the soft box that we're using to take a picture of this. And then on the right is a picture of the dog tooth cat snake that I saw my first ever night safari. So uh, this is using a TG5 and a diving lamp. And then, um, you know, editor Roy, who is really excited about using Lightroom for the first time, you know, really pumped the color on that one. Uh, you can see I really did some cosmetic surgery on the eye there. So uh, there's, I, I can now quantitatively say my photography and my Lightroom has, has improved a lot since uh, it's my first, my first ever safari. Moving on to another cat snake, uh, and you can see here its eye does, looks nothing like a cat's eye. You know, just just pointing that out again that these things are have really strange names. Uh, this is the black-headed cat snake, and you can see it's also got a pale color, and it's probably got a similar lifestyle to the other one, but it's got like a slightly darker head, so hence the name. And uh, this is kind of the textbook body shot that I got of it. And then moving over to here, it was kind of like pointed more towards the ground, and uh, I got my camera and put it on my foot and just kind of started shooting it uh, directly at the snake's head. And I got this shot from, of that, which I was really, really happy with. And um, using that wide aperture meant that the body kind of like dissolved into the background, which I was really happy about. So I'm uh, really happy with this shot. And I even got the tongue out. So, you know, I got bonus points for that. That was achievement unlocked right there. 
Uh, moving back over to Pit Vipers, uh, this is from a trip that I did to Sumatra. So I was actually going over there uh, to look at orangutans, and I had some great pictures of those. But the safari guide uh, told me he knew where a female, this is a female waggler's pit viper. And there was one that lived near the village in a, like an old abandoned hut. And it was very docile and like it was, you know, very uh, easy to handle for the safari guide. So uh, I got went over and got, got him to help me take some pictures of it. And as you can see, it was just on this branch and it was just kind of hanging out. So I got some full body shots and uh, using my diffuser, I got some um, some shots of its head. And then it kind of did this thing where it dipped its head down uh, below the branch and it kind of hung there and it just kind of looked at me and it looked at the safari guide. And it it was really funny. It had a very interesting personality. It was just kind of bemused by us almost. And I got a shot and I didn't even remember taking it, but in the moment, but uh, it's this next shot um, that I think for me, this is this is definitely my favorite picture of a snake I've ever taken. But um, I don't even remember taking this specific shot. I was just kind of like trying to get as many pictures of its head as possible. But uh, this one, like I, I've never been able to mimic the focus. Uh, like there's something going on here that like I really like how the focus like kind of like kind of uh, fades into into its head. And then you have its its body in the background. And uh, the other funny story about about this picture is that this is the desktop background that I use whenever I have a, a difficult meeting with a company who's maybe <laughs> upset with us. What I'll do is I'll I'll bring my laptop to the to the company, you know, their their headquarters. I'll set up my my laptop. I'll plug it in, and then this jumps out at them. And I've, had, I've actually had. Uh, you know, sometimes I've had people scream when they saw it, and you know, <laughs> I, 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 interesting it, strategy. <laughs> and, you know, I, sometimes I forget how like super phobic people are of snakes. It's actually mm -hmm. it kind of depresses me a little bit. But um, yeah, I like I, I put this up, and then um, yeah, I, I like to think it gives me a, like a a small edge when I whenever I'm in a difficult meeting. But um, yeah, this is this is definitely my 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 National Geographic picture here. So. Yeah, as good as like, though, the lighting the lighting on the head it oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah this is the box, so man. Yeah. yeah no I'm, I'm i'm i've you know what i've actually tried to get you know once i saw this image i was like oh i need to get more of these shots and actually i had an idea for a project where i wanted to get like every species of snake with this shot and then you know maybe like i could have like like a set of all of these pit vipers with, with this exact pose and i've never been able to replicate it so i i, I still quite you know, I'm clearly I have some still have some learning to do, but yeah, this is definitely my, my favorite shot. Hey Roy, uh yeah, sure. do you remember your F stop for this particular shot? Yeah, I can look it up, absolutely. Um and it was actually it looks like I'm I'm right in its face, but I'm actually a fair distance away. And this is I looked it up and it was actually using my 60 mil macro mm -hmm. um like lens. So you know, I, I really I really rate that lens because you can get all the way in on on like a jumping spider's eyebrow. But you can also pull back and you can get really great shots of snakes. So, you know, it means when I'm out in the middle of the jungle, I don't have to switch uh, lenses. So uh, I, I really love that lens. Yeah, the depth of field is perfect on this. You've got yeah. shots from the eye to the snout. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, Thank you. Thank you. Randy Orton, eat your heart out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, cool. I'll have to look him up there. <laughs> and then, um, you know, again, uh, this is another thing I actually like doing, which is just getting like a like the kind of the color scheme of snakes. And um, I know my brother, uh, Henry, has actually said this is a really good, useful thing for him because he can kind of take these color schemes and blend it into his architectural work and like his interior design. And again, I, I think it's fascinating that you can see these scales and it's almost like the snake's body is like there is a band of yellow here and it, it doesn't matter which scales are there, you know, like you can actually see like one scale has yellow and white and black. And so it clearly, you know, it's like, this is where the color is gonna go. And the, the scales just kind of deal with it. You know, and I, I find that so fascinating. And uh, I, I really like getting these color schemes. And funnily enough, I actually had a friend in London um, who is into belly dancing. And she's like super duper into it. And she has really elaborate outfits that she wears for her hobby. And she actually took some of these um, some of these pictures and used it as a reference to make new outfits for her stuff. So Ooh. all kinds of interesting applications for <laughs> this uh, these these kinds of pictures. So yeah, really, I, I really like getting these shots. 
Oh, so there's oh. a belly dancer with a waggless pit viper. I know, right? Outfit. I know. I'm like, wow. Man, like, that sounds cool. I, I know. I, I tell you what, I'll need to get her to send me a picture of um if she if she has any pictures of her dancing, I'll try and put it on my Instagram. <laughs> so uh still still staying with the waggler's pit. Wait, is this yes, this is waggler's pit art. This is a juvenile male. Uh, so you can see that the males are green with a red stripe going down their their side. But the, when they're juveniles, the, the green is very subdued and it's quite a pale subject. And uh, this this uh, snake was so small, I could actually take it with my my normal insect diffuser. So it's just a very common. This was a great uh, snake. That it's like he would stick his tongue out like almost on command. It was really good. Um, yeah, so then I got an adult one. So this is an adult male Waggler's Pit Viper. And they're about a third of the size of the female that you saw in the previous pictures. And as you can see, that like all the males, every pit viper is this a, is this a thing? Like every male pit viper seems to be like green with like red and white on it. So um, is this like Stephen? Is this like a like a normal thing? Because they all seem to like I, I wouldn't be able to tell a lot of these guys apart from each other. Um, there's some small variation between the male Waggler's pit viper mm. and the male Hagen's mm. pit viper. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, the male he. Is it Kinabalu pit viper? Yeah, Kinab uh, Sumatran pit mm. viper, sorry. Also mm. is mostly green, but there's yeah, yeah. a very slight variation in the color and the stripe that's going down that yeah. depends the, the dorsal and the, mm. Mm -hmm. the belly. Um, I, just, yeah, but, I just find it weird how, you know, you'd think it would be like, you know, yellow and white and black like, like the yeah. female, but no, it's like they all seem to be like green with uh, yeah. white and red. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's certainly some exceptions as well. There are other mm. vipers out there where the males are not green, mm. but like brown or some other color. Mm. And there are other examples of uh, pit vipers with males and females that look very, very similar. But yes, the waggler's pit viper does um, have a very distinct sexual dimorphism that males and females look completely different. Yeah. All right, back to you, Roy. Hmm. Yeah, no, interesting. Um, okay, so this is the... Yeah, male waggler's pit viper. And this is, so I'm going to show you a comparison here, but this is like with the light direct, like coming straight from where my camera is onto the subject. And you can see everything's lit. There's no shadows anywhere. And there's there's no like kind of like artistic effects, you know, one might say. So this is a good kind of like almost what I would call a textbook shot for me anyway. I'm usually a lot more abstract with uh, <laughs> a lot of my other work. And the next shot, all I'm going to do is I got Steven to move the diffuser to the back of the snake. So all, all, you know, you can see like the kind of, it's like changes the picture completely. And all I did was move uh, the light source to it, to like more kind of like going straight down or, or maybe even off to the side from behind it. So you can see like how different the effects you get, you, just moving the light around the light source, um, getting different kinds of shadows and going in different places, you get like a totally different picture. So. This is something I really want to experiment more with in in uh, in the future, and um, I think when it's done right, this kind of like really dark picture looks amazing. And there's some photographers mm. I, I idolize uh, that they they're really good at this. So it's like it's one of those things I really want to get like a couple of shots that I'm happy with. Uh, this is just an example. Yeah. And then I thought it was interesting also to kind of um, you know I'm always trying to find new poses and new compositions. And I thought it was interesting to kind of zoom in again on this guy's scales. Uh, so again, you know, you're seeing these little white and red uh, patches everywhere and they, they, they kind of go across scales and this pattern is, is all over its body. So uh, again, th these snakes are uh, super interesting to me how they're doing the, their color schemes. Uh, this is a uh, Bornean killed pit viper. So this is when I went over to Sarawak for a business meeting and then I took the weekend off and just went into the, into the jungle. I think this was over in, um, I'm trying to think whether it might have been Baco National Park. Uh, but yeah, this is over in Sarawak. And uh, Bornean keel pit vipers are apparently very closely related to Waggler's pit vipers. In fact, yes. they were considered like a variation of them at one point before they were now declared like a separate species. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, is that, is that, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, yeah. I yeah. still remember when there were both Tropilodemus Waggler, right? But yeah, ah, this gotcha. is now subannulatus as you've listed. Yes. Yeah, perfect. So you'll notice that this picture is really full of, uh, you know, color and the background. Um, you can even see bokeh balls going on here. Um, this is taken during the day. So 
this is actually going through these pictures. Um, I really thought to myself like, wow, I really wish I saw more pit vipers during the daytime because um, I absolutely loved how these uh, daytime shots came out. And this is just using natural light. Um, as far as I remember, there was no, I didn't use a diffuser or anything. And it was actually so freeing not having a flash or any kind of equipment. It was just me, a camera and a snake. And um, it was quite challenging to get my settings. I think I adjusted the settings around to like have a slower shutter speed so to kind of get more of that light in there. But um, I really loved uh, the effect. And I, I actually see other people's pictures of natural light uh, photography. And I, I just, I think it's absolutely beautiful. So that's something I really want to do more with in the future. And then as you can see, there was some other, uh, I had to use like the widest, I think it was, must've been like F 2.8 because um, anything more would, would just make it too dark. So, um, you know, you get these really abstract blurry shots, which I love, so. Yeah, the heat sensing pits is very visible in this. But oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, good point. Yeah, this is a this is for anyone who's wondering why they're called pit vipers. It's uh, the heat sensing organ in the front of their uh, their 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 uh, I the guess eyes. Exactly. Yeah, and right in front of the eyes. Yeah, the nostril is just out of focus in this shot. <laughs> oh yeah, there there's plenty that's out of focus. When, you know, it's kind of um, the the heat sensing pit is very is quite visible here. And then of course they're look just getting that that shot of getting that color scheme in there and uh, i thought these scales were really beautiful too so uh just the way that it has like that kind of like shift from green to to yellow really love this this snake was really stunning this is a female by the way and then this is the male so you can see again you've got to me it looks almost functionally identical to the the male waggler's pit viper so again all these males uh, they, they just kind of the same uh green color with the red and white uh coloration going along and then uh, just moving over to the uh, oriental vine snake again, this is um, this is like a variation, or this is a different species of um, the oriental vine snake. This is like the speckled vine snake. I don't think we ever really fully tied down the species idea on this, but this was a, just a snake we found out out in the um, Buca Chiara. And uh, I got this, this shot of it uh, that I was really happy with. Uh, if you actually zoom in on this, the eye is very, very in focus, like it's pin sharp um, once you kind of zoom in on there. And what I love about this is that there was, a, you know, my favorite pictures in nature are the ones that have serendipity in them. So if you look at the pictures before and after this shot, uh, it's looking in different directions. And, you know, you don't get that like 100% like dead on, like straight shot of this guy's uh, uh, face. And you can actually see he's got like this really interesting expression. And when I showed it to my friend, uh, he said, you know what, that's the that's the expression my girlfriend has when I take the last slice of pizza. <laughs> you can see it's kind of got like one eye cocked up. You know, anyway, it's pretty funny. And then here's the full body shot of that. So you can see this uh, beautifully uh, pale speckled vine snake. And actually, if you look closely in this, you can see it's got that warning. Um, uh, sign so you can see that it kind of moves its scales apart you can see that black and white pattern going on to um on its scale so that i think that's actually a warning signal uh when it feels threatened so um you got some another interesting example of that in a second here uh just to show you what a normal oriental vine uh, snake sorry with. roy yeah go ahead yeah i just want to mention that um we were not sure about the idea of this snake because hechila fasciolata or the speckled vine snake is usually hmm. reddish brown with some ah. speckles all around the face uh, and the neck. Uh, but uh, I, I'm pretty certain this is Hechila fasciolata, but some people are saying that this is Hechila pressina, which is the regular mm. oriental vine snake. Uh, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, mm. I'm rather certain that this is fasciolata because uh, there are other people out there online that has photographed mm. a similar color morph of this species. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but this is rather unusual for the species. They usually Ooh. dark brown or reddish brown with some speckles. Yeah, yeah, no, it's super, super interesting snake, and they're they're really iconic. You can see that they're that. Well, I can show you this one. Um, you know that this is like a what I would say like the the typical Oriental vine snake is mm -hmm. colored. Yep. Yeah, the conventional. It's got that. Yeah, that stunning green color, which I think. Uh, looking at this now in, in the cold light of day, I think I got the color balance on this maybe a little bit off, but that's generally the, co the green color you can see. And um, you can see actually behind this subject's head, it's got like some scratches and that's because they usually prey on uh, small lizards uh, and they hang around in trees. And so they probably mm -hmm. had this, this subject probably had a, a lizard claw the back of his neck. 
Um, but uh, they're they're really an iconic snake, and they look uh, they, they have an amazing like thin thin look to them. So as I mentioned before, they they do this um, display where they have the kind of like um, they move their scales apart to show that black and white pattern you can see on its body to uh, kind of ward off predators. And I saw I think this ah there there's a good example of it. You can actually zoom in, you can see that pattern. Uh, it's just from their scales moving apart. The skin underneath I think is is got different color patterns on it. And it's supposed to ward off predators, I guess. Um, but there's also another snake that had a really interesting uh, threat display. Uh, this is a bronze a painted bronzeback snake. And this is just a typical picture of it. In fact, this, this subject was seen recently. I wasn't even going to include it uh, because they're, they're quite common. But you can see <laughs> this one kind of interesting because it's got uh, this fat. And uh, if you look on the bottom left, it's, you can see it's eaten recently. So it's kind of a funny subject. And then you, here you can see its face. But actually, this next uh, slide here. Uh, so this is a video I took of this painted bronze back that was doing an interesting display. And uh, if I think if I tap the screen, it will play the video. So you can see the snake moving up. Just watch what it does. Oh, that. That. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's really cute. I have never seen that myself, actually. Yeah. So wow. um, I was really, I was really stoked because I remembered that today, and I was like, "Oh, that was another threat display that I, or I, I don't know. Yeah, I get. What would you call it? Threat display? But um, so yeah, let me just play it. Oh, hang on. Yeah. Let me try and play that again. So some see people it. argue that that motion is to warm up their muscles, like mm. how how a cat would shake its butt before they pounce, mm. so <laughs> that it can a uh, bolt, you know, with its muscles. Yeah. And, capacity yeah. but you know the reason the reason i even have video of this is because it, it did it several times before I, I i pulled my phone out and got it i mean it was like you know it was very intentional the snake was looking like directly at me doing this like you know feet away from me so it was very intentional and i thought it was fascinating behavior uh but otherwise bronze bronze backs are, are pretty common uh, we see them all the time and uh uh, they're they're pretty uh, pretty common, but I, I've never seen another snake do that uh, that that behavior before. Oh, huh. and a bronze bag of all. Yes. Even you you've never seen this behavior on I've bronze I've never bags? seen this in person, but I've seen videos of paradise mm. tree snakes doing this. Mm. Oh. Roy, did you show this to your belly dancer friend? <laughs> <laughs> Chan, maybe we should invite her next time for a talk. Man. Yeah, oh, oh, that'll man. be a good. Oh, she'll be a good subject. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah, no, definitely. I'll have to show her that. Okay. So, uh, moving, moving past snakes, there are actually other things in the jungle, believe it or not, Stephen, um, yes. you know, or, <laughs> would you believe it? So this is, I haven't got many lizard pictures, I don't think, but this is an earless agamid lizard. Um, and I, I guess it doesn't have any ears. That's probably these biologists. I, I honestly don't know how they come up with these names, but, um, this is a pretty standard looking lizard, except it has a blue mouth. Uh, so this is a really, Ooh. I took this picture when I was still working out how my camera works and I, I thought I was really cool, like taking like F 2.8 shots of everything. Um, but you can see here, you can, there's like a really distinct blue tinge to its mouth and whenever it feels threatened, it will open and show you the, 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 uh, blue mouth. So, uh, pretty, pretty interesting lizard for that. Uh, looking at other lizards, there's Cool's Flying Gecko. Uh, so this this gecko has like webbed feet and uh, like a really flat tail, and it uses wow. it to jump from trees and glide around in the rainforest. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, here's a picture showing the full body shot. That so is... it, it's very, it's well adapted for gliding around the rainforest. And um, uh, it's pretty amazing looking lizard as well, just uh, in, in, in and of itself, really amazing camouflage too. And then this is a terrible shot. But the main reason I wanted to put it on here is that I took the shot in Langkawi, went back home and I did it and I found out its scientific name is Gecko Gecko. So which <laughs> I, I just thought was so funny that I just had to put it in this in this presentation. Anyway, that was it. That's all I wanted to show you. Oh, and was that with your phone, Roy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it might have been on my like a quick ID shot. You know, right. this is people What's just take ID. Oh, it's Toke Gecko. Wait. Yeah, it should be yeah. T T O K A Y, right? No, there's well, some variation in the spelling. That's yeah, yeah. okay too. But uh, yeah. was this recent, Roy? Yeah, this was uh, just in Langkawi, and uh, they they apparently have a really distinctive call. Like, is that right, Stephen? Can you give yeah. us an impression? Oh, that's yeah. That. 
Oh, that. <laughs> oh, I hear that all the time. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, I just thought I thought it was really funny that someone actually called this thing the gecko gecko, which is you know it's like the most gecko of all the geckos. Anyway, uh, I think Elin has a question. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, Elin, you have your hands up. Do you have a question? No, I don't. You must have a mistake. Oh. Uh, all right, no worries. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, go on, worries. go on. All right, just moving on. Um, a couple of turtle shots. Uh, left, left here is a spiny, spiny turtle from. Uh, Stephen and I had this one night where we we saw like two different turtles, and I don't think I've had any other night where we saw any. So we Ooh. we kind of joked that it was like the night of the turtles. <laughs> so, so here on the left, you can see the subject, which was a spiny turtle, and it's very old. So a lot of the spines have been rubbed off. And uh, you can see it's quite a large, it's a really big, really big turtle. And on the right is uh, just a Google image picture showing you what a younger turtle looks like mm -hmm. uh, with all its spines still intact. So that's where its names come from. And then you can see like getting closer in, we can, we can get some really soulful shots of, uh, you know, the turtle looking directly at us and a uh, really amazing creature. And these things can live for like a hundred years or something. So uh, probably took a long time to rub all those spines off. Mm -hmm. And then looking at another turtle, uh, something that's a little Ooh. more iconic, the soft shell turtle. This is a Dogania saplana. This is actually a monotypic uh, species. So it's the only one in its genus. And uh, it's really well adapted for living in uh, river streams, uh, feeding off uh, snails that it finds apparently. Ooh. And you can see it's got this really long snout, which it pokes above the water. So it can kind of bury its whole body down in the sediment and just kind of, you know, point its schnoz above the water and it can breathe through that. Sweet. So it's uh, really well adapted for that. I think I've even heard people eat these things. So I hope I hope this picture, I hope this picture is is cute enough to convince people that that's maybe not the great the best idea, and that there's far more tasty animals out there to eat. So mm. just look at that face. How could how could you put <laughs> that face into a pot of boiling water? I mean, honestly, look at it. Look how cute. It is. So anyway. Uh, uh, sorry, Roy. Sorry, we're... sorry, Roy. Uh, without yeah. say, without you don't have to give us the location. Uh, like, what, what sort of habitat was this in when you took these two oh. turtles? Yeah, it was in a stream bed. Um, oh. Yeah, it was. Um, it, we we saw it kind of like uh, swimming around, and I think we we quickly grabbed it for a picture, but uh, we put it straight back, and uh, we we try to disturb the wildlife as little as possible, of course. Mm. Cool, cool. So moving on, uh, this is easily one of one of my favorite frogs. Uh, this is the cinnamon frog. Uh, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that Latin name, um, but you can see it's a, just a stunning uh, red color and it's bright orange. I have no idea how this thing survives so, for so long in the rainforest, other than the predators probably think it's too cool to eat and they just decide not to eat it. And that's <laughs> that's its defense. And moving into some closer shots, you can see um, it's really well behaved like it, it had it didn't try to get away or anything. It just kind of sat there very happily letting us take pictures of it. And zooming in, you can see all these little cinnamon specks all over its back, which I thought was a really interesting pattern. You can tell the macro photographer in me never goes away, even when I'm herping. You know, it's like, uh, it's one of the things. One of, one of the other interesting things about the cinnamon frog is that when I tried to ID it, the common name that came up was like Peter's frog. Like, you know who on earth sees this and decides to call it Peter's frog? I mean, this is this is clearly a cinnamon frog. There's no other common name for it, in my opinion. So I hope you all join me in changing the world and convincing everyone that we should call it a cinnamon frog. You know? Yeah, I'm definitely on team cinnamon frog. Reddit. Oh, good. Okay. Frog. You know, there are dozens of us. Literally dozens of us. <laughs> anyway. Uh, there, Malaysia is home to tons of different kinds of rainforest frogs, and I, I'm absolutely, I love all of them. Uh, probably one of my favorites, though, is the Malayan flying, flying frog. So um, this is uh, like a, just a, it looks like a very common uh, green uh, tree frog, uh, but it actually has very uh, beautiful uh, red webbed feet. And so it's almost like a very iconic, uh, you know, tree frog that you would normally find uh, out in the jungle. But uh, unfortunately, every time I've seen it, it always like curls up its toes and feet and it tucks them underneath its body so you can't see anything. And uh, so I've never gotten, this is really the ideal shot that I really want to get, but I still haven't been able to get it. Yeah. The uh, other... Sorry, mm -hmm. Roy, I wanted to add mm -hmm. something. Uh, mm -hmm. If you pull up that white background picture again, mm -hmm. you see that the green, uh, sorry, the frog is a lot browner than I was the just one that you've 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Was, go ahead. That was the other the other thing that makes this 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 frog really tricky to photograph or get get the shot that I really want to get of it is that um, the more disturbed it is, and as soon as it sees you, it basically starts turning brown, and so it's really hard to uh, get it to be in this position with its webbed feet spread out, and then also be this beautiful uh, shade of bright green that uh, you know is really what we think of when we think of frogs. So uh, still a future shot that I'm going to get. And in the meantime, here's a like a lovely wide angle that I, I, I really liked of it. Now, here's one of my pieces de resistance is the Wallace's flying frog. Um, I actually, it's a really big frog. Oh, it's, this shot though. Oh yeah, well, I mean, this, this frog is, is beautiful. I mean, you can see it's webbed feet, uh, really characterful. And it's really big. It's actually about the size of my open hand. And um, we actually went on this this night safari specifically to get it. Uh, it. It tends to be we tend to find it out in Semenya. Excuse me. Ooh. Oh, and, this uh, this was the one we found to get. Oh, okay, okay. That's right. Yeah. Oh, is oh that that's why the yeah. post looks so familiar. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you know, Wallace's flying frog is like probably one of the most famous frogs in all of Malaysia. You know, when I when I actually looked at some herping websites. Um, some of them had a wish list and Wallace's flying frog was actually number one on their wish list of think places they want to go and things they want to see. Uh, so I, I feel really privileged to have seen this. And the other the reason it's called Wallace's flying frog is because it's named after Sir Alfred Wallace, who Sir Alfred Russell Wallace, sorry, um, who is a co-discoverer of evolution along with Charles Darwin. And he actually came up with the idea of evolution by seeing this frog uh, flying around the forest and, and de deciding that it must have evolved that characteristic. So this is a really amazing, uh, it, you know, characterful frog. It's beautiful to look at, but it also has like a really incredible history to it as well. So I'm really pleased to have gotten a shot of it, not only with um, with my TG5, but then later on with my with my EM5 and getting a proper diffusion and all the lighting correct. And the cool thing about these frogs as well is that they they actually mm. lay their eggs above uh, puddles in the rainforest. So they'll they'll make these little nests on leaves, and then the tadpoles will develop inside that nest and then drop into the puddle when they're ready to uh, leave the nest, and then they'll they'll finish off their development uh, in that water puddle. So they're mm. highly highly adapted to living in trees. Uh, really fascinating species. Uh, other frogs that are really cool that I see quite a lot are uh, litter frogs. So this one's a spotted litter frog. It has uh, these cool red eyes and it loves to um, kind of stand on the on its uh, front legs uh, in the fashion you're seeing in this picture. And then here's its cousin, the black eyed litter frog. Uh, also really cool to look at and uh, see in the forest. And then here's my thumb for scale. Just to show you how, uh, how small these things are. One of the things I like doing, at least with things that aren't poisonous or venomous, is I like to put my, my hand or my thumb and just give you a sense of scale. But uh, as you can see, I haven't really got a lot of that with uh, any of the uh, the poisonous pit vipers or, or sorry, the venomous pit vipers or any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then of course, uh, just to finish <laughs> off here, looking at the Malayan horn frog, um, this is a, the, the, probably the most iconic uh, herp in all of, uh, all of Malaysia. This is actually the logo uh, for the MS. Uh, Herpetology and uh, yes, SIT logo. <laughs> exactly. We get the shit on today, Stephen. Nice. And um, I, I absolutely love these guys. Like they have such great uh, expressions. In fact, when I sent this picture to my dad uh, and, and and said, "Dad, check this out," he was like, "Huh, that's the same expression I have every morning when I read the news." You know, so. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> so uh, they're I and they're they're really good subjects. They're they they're very docile. They they just kind of sit there and let you take pictures, and they they don't really seem to care. And then I just, I thought this, this picture was so funny. I had to include it as well. So, yeah. I really hate the nipples. <laughs> <laughs> wait, you're wait, still, you're still yeah. going to see these frogs around, man. Oh, yeah, exactly. There's no escaping them, the okay? There's I no really, escaping the nipples, it man. It looks cool, but you got nipples. Why? Why? I know. Well, I, I, could, I could have Photoshopped them out, but they just had <laughs> Staying I felt on. like they... Or I could have blurred. I could have blurred them out with a little censored area or something. But no, they, they add they add too much character. You know, it's like put yeah. on a bra. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so that kind of finishes up all the hurt pictures that I have. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Stephen, who's been um, coming with me on all these night safaris for a couple of years now, and um, he's been my trusted guide and uh, frog spotter all across <laughs> the, the the rainforest in Malaysia. 
And I, I've, I've, I've told him he needs to patent his glasses because he seems to be able to see frogs around the corner in pitch black. And know, right? I'm, I'm, yep. convinced, I'm convinced it's something to do with the glasses he wears, that they have <laughs> night vision in them or there's some kind of special technology in there. But um, he's, um, yeah, big shout out to Stephen for helping me find all of this stuff and uh, getting me out there. And, and, and then more importantly, back again in one piece. <laughs> yeah most welcome bro <laughs> and uh just to finish off this whole talk here before i take questions uh, i wanted to show you a picture of my niece uh kirana and uh here in this picture you can't see it fully but she's wearing this is a picture we took over christmas and she's wearing like the most like fluffy like princess dress you've ever seen it's like sparkles and like just the girliest thing you could possibly think of uh you can't see it but she's wearing like pink shoes with like sparkles all over them and they even have like leds that light up and uh every time she walks around so she she's just like the, the girliest girl you could ever imagine but she also like just naturally loves snakes she loves tarantulas bugs she actually she's in this picture she's only like five or six years old and she held a scorpion when we went to this bug museum in thailand and i just want to show people this because I think at a certain age, people are almost think that they're supposed to like not like snakes anymore. And they're not like they're not allowed to like bugs. And everyone always goes, Ooh, I don't like that. In fact, uh, probably half my friend group refused to come out on night safaris with me because they're mm -hmm. scared of snakes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to show this because you don't, you don't have to teach your kids to be scared of them. They're actually uh, this, you know, you can see here, this is a harmless vine snake and they're actually beautiful, stunning animals. So anyone watching this that has kids, please try to raise your kids to be as cool as Kirana. You know, we need more, we need more kids who are like not scared of snakes and appreciate them because uh, there's never been a time where snakes and bugs and creepy crawlies and everything else that lives in the rainforest needed your help more. So try to raise your kids to be like Kirana. Great. And we need more cool uncles like you. I, I mean, yeah. cool there's uncle. only, there's only so many uncles to go around, but you know, by God, we're, we're, trying, we're trying to, we're trying to, just one one uncle at a time, Stephen. That's how we're going to do this. <laughs> okay, so let me get back to. I think you can you see me now? Yeah. Yes. Great. Yes. Roy, you can see. Thank you, Roy. That was okay. it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. Amazing. I really shots. enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys. Really, thank you so much to Malaysian uh, Nature Society for for having me on and inviting me to do this talk. I'm I'm honored, and You're and welcome. I'm even more excited to be giving my first talk to the MNS because I have yes. recently been invited to be uh, head of their entomology SIG. So uh, for anyone Congrats, watching, Roy. Congratulations, uh, I, Roy. Will, I will be trying to head up um, the entomology side of this and I'll be doing similar talks. So watch this space because I have a lot of plans and I'm going to be bringing a lot mm. of things to the society in terms of entomology that I think uh, is really going to blow people away. And it's going to be focused very heavily on showcasing how beautiful insects are and uh, other invertebrates and arthropods so mm. i'm really excited to show all this all this stuff to you in the future let me link that in the thank chat you, thank here you. we go that should be it yeah, we really appreciate all your efforts in yeah moving forward really i'm i can't tell you how excited i am yeah i'm just gonna be really cool great great okay is there anything else and is there any questions or any anything um, yeah floor's open question. everybody uh, oh, yeah, uh roy uh what's your iNaturals id i want to see more pictures yeah uh it's uh roy the dive bro so that's what i oh. use for everything and okay. I, I think it's really funny that i'm now mainly doing land-based stuff but mm -hmm. i'm just going to keep using this roy the dive bro because i thought i was going to be like a i was going to quit my day job and become an underwater photographer but you know i'm joking like i wasn't <laughs> um just in case anyone from my company is watching this no. uh, <laughs> but, uh, but um yeah i thought that was gonna be my thing and uh i just think it's really funny that like hardly any of my stuff is now underwater it's all like land-based but yeah so roy the dive bro just literally you can find my i think that's my youtube handle as well so cool. you can see my other talks on there um so yeah cool and and yeah seriously uh you can actually friend me on iNaturalist i think and then like anytime you upload something i can then help you idea so you know if we all get together and start building in like a big network it'll really help awesome yeah. awesome great anyone else anyone else got any questions regarding um uh, i got behind? another question um back to the slug eating snake uh oh wait no i think it was the whip snake 
uh, I notice it's Hosota and then CF and then its species name. What's CF? Uh, I think it's Latin for confer, which is, we use that to denote like kind of that like... we have some doubts to the ID. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, oh. Uh, yeah. so it's different I... from SP, right? SP is still for species. Yeah, okay. and if you see SPP, that's species plural. It yeah. means like there's multiple, but yeah, you don't yeah. know exactly what species. Okay. If, you're, if you're writing, say, for example, heteropoda, SPP, you're saying uh, multiple heteropoda species. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you answered that question, Stephen, because <laughs> I actually, I was thinking about that earlier. I was like, what does that mean? There's so much taxonomy is, is like a really weird mm -hmm. uh, beast sometimes. Like, I don't even yeah. understand. But, you know, I, I understand it to a point that I'm interested and then I, I kind of stop because I'm, it's not that important to mm -hmm. me. Like, mm -hmm. overall, I think it's, if I can get to the genus level, I'm usually pretty okay with that. Okay, uh, cool. Uh, 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 Zahida uh, on, on Facebook is asking, can you share references that you use to ID the frogs? How do you ID? How do you ID frogs, uh, Roy? I, I just send the picture to Stephen. Thank <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey. I'll, I'll take the question for you. Uh, yeah. You can use iNaturalist or use yeah. Ecology Asia or frogs of Borneo dot org. I think yeah. That Honestly, is. actually, iNaturalist is great for this. Like my frog pictures on there get ID'd like almost instantly. Like it's it's very quick. Yeah. Yeah, we used to have amphibia dot my as well, but I'm not sure if it's still active. Mm. Yeah, there, there's a really active community for. Um, uh, frogs, snakes, and her herps. People who, who are into herps are super active. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. naturalists. So yeah, it's it's only us. We just need more entomologists. We need people who are you know spider guys and more <clears throat> spider guys. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Roy, you've got a question in the chat. Sure. Sure. Oh, can, sorry. Could you read it out? Because okay, I, yeah, I'll, 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 do do I'll do it. I'll do it. Uh, I'll do it. Go ahead, T. Uh, curious, what settings did you use for Olympus TG5? Was it just in microscope mode plus your dive video light? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think it was, oh, yeah, if I remember, it was in P mode. So um, I, I would use P mode and then, yeah, it's basically, um, maybe now that I'm more experienced, I would know to like move the light. So like the less light the, the TG5 has, the, the shorter the aperture will get. Or wait, am I getting it? No, sorry. Yeah. The, the wider your aperture will be. Um, and then you can kind of move the camera backwards and forwards to kind of uh, adjust the depth of field. Um, so yeah, if P mode, and then I, I use my own like hand torch, uh, which, which I recommend covering with a diffuser, by the way. So get like a cloth bag, uh, like a white cloth bag and use that because other, it's actually probably better for the subject too, because they, they don't have like a direct light source shining in their eye for a long period of time. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I got a question, uh, Roy. Uh, what's been like the herb in your childhood that really inspired you to, uh, to get to get involved with macro photography? Like, uh, like, um, like, mm. yeah, from where you were born in. Mm -hmm. Oh man, uh, you know, I think yeah. The first, the first, there's probably a better answer to this, but the actual, the first story that comes to mind is the, the, the toad that lived under a stump in my backyard. And I even had it. I even had a name for him. I called him Golden Eyes. Um, you know, I, the James Bond movie hadn't even come out yet. That's how ahead of the curve I was. And um, yeah, so <laughs> Golden Eyes, the Golden Eyes, the 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 toad used to live in my back garden. And I actually used to watch him like eat bugs with his tongue, which I was like, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Mm. And um, yeah, it was really. Mm. I even knew. I even learned to pick him up like by his you shouldn't disturb wildlife too much but i was a kid i didn't know so whatever mm -hmm. um but yeah you i had to i learned to pick him up so he didn't pee on me you know so uh all oh. kinds of stuff um but yeah that was the that's definitely the the formative memory i have but i was always as a teenager i was always keeping scorpions and you know all, all kinds of insects and when i moved to malaysia i actually got some praying mantises as pets i had to practice macro photography on so this has just been one of those things that's always in the background of my life somewhere. Sometimes I forget them. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, the floor is open to uh, everybody. Everybody. In the meantime, uh, do you remember like what kind of toad it was? Was it like a buffo buffo or just a, just a really? If you go maybe maybe go on iNaturalist, zoom into Oklahoma. <laughs> And just look at like what the most common bullfrog or toad what would be, and you know it was very, 
cool. it was super common but yeah it was so cool like when he came out at night and he would just kind of sit on my mm-hmm. just sit on my driveway like like looking for bugs and he would you know hop around it was really cool because awesome. you know his tongue would flick out and the, the cockroach would disappear you know it's, it was totally totally awesome as a kid awesome awesome uh i got a question um well you've traveled a lot from borneo to sumatra and like uh, such uh what's the destination that you were really like uh, like it's mm-hmm. your favorite oh man the best first of all i just want to say like I mean, I was surprised how many herp pictures I had, considering I'm I'm mostly focused on entomology. Um, or I guess that's the most most of the stuff I see is entomology. So I was really surprised how many herp pictures I had. Um, but you know what? I haven't even I haven't even scratched the surface of like how many freaking snakes and frogs and like the specific shots I want to get in Malaysia. I think. I think it's literally going to take the rest of my life to get all the shots of all the different snakes and stuff that I want to get. Um, you know, if you ask me that question, the first, the number one first thing that comes to mind is uh, Wayneson, Wayneson Tay, who's in, in this chat. Wayneson, put your Instagram in the comments so people can see your work. Um, what was the, the, the keel? There was like a dragon keeled snake or the dragon. Dragon oh, snake. If we can that's that's that again. Thank you. Oh, that uh, one. Okay. man, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And I really wanted to, I really wanted to go see that. And um, the other one that I'm, I'm, I saw some, some people here recently saw, and I'm really jealous is the bush, the, the bush, uh, sorry, the mangrove uh, pit viper. So yeah, I, I really want to collect all the pit vipers. I mean, they're, they're clearly the most stunning snake. If I had like an ultimate wish list, um, I would want to go to uh, Iran or Afghanistan. I can't remember where it is. And there's a there's a pit viper that has like a snake that, or sorry, a tail that is adapted to look like a spider. So it tempts oh. birds to come in and try and eat it. Oh yeah, that one. That, so, one, yeah. that one. Yes, yes. One day, one day when I win the lottery, I'm gonna take Stephen to Iran and we're gonna go photograph that thing. I think. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, Madagascar seems like a really a great place to go for mm. everything. So, you know, I'd love to go and check that place out, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't know, actually. Yeah, there, there's so much stuff left in Southeast Asia. I think it would take the rest of my life to mm. even work my way around this, around all the stuff here. So I, I'm still tons of work left to do. Mm. Steven, Steven, are you hearing that? There's a lot of work left to do, buddy. Yes. Like, you're, yeah. you're not done by a long shot, my friend. Oh, like, oh no. <laughs> well, are, are there any more questions from the floor? Hi, Ayin. Nice of you to join us. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us, Ayin. Okay, cool. And I, I see Jaimir here as well. Hi, Jaimir. It's been a while. Hello. If there are no questions, then we're going to call it a night. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Roy. Thank you so much for sharing. And I hope everyone here had a glimpse into the world of macro photography, had a glimpse into the biodiversity that we have in Malaysia. And yeah, watch this space. Roy will be running the entomology group. And he's got really cool stuff coming up. And watch the herb group space because we'll have some pretty cool herping locations coming up. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we have some uh, macro trips to look forward to in the future. I think. Probably, yes. <laughs> yes, if we collaborate and all that. Uh, that's going to happen, Chan. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited that. for all of it. Uh, thank you, thank you guys again so much for having me on here. It's been a real pleasure and a real honor. No thank problems. You. You're most welcome, Roy. You're most welcome as and well. And thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Cool. I'll yeah. just quickly check the comments as well just to see if I missed anything. Saw a lot of thank thank you for everyone to uh, for joining. Really appreciate your support. Mm. And uh, yeah, if I haven't mentioned, my Instagram is uh, Roy the Dive Bro. So feel free to go on there and check all check all my stuff on there. And um, yeah, okay. Yeah, feel free to just hang Great around stuff. and chit chat with us. Yeah, so yeah. Gonna, well, the room is gonna be open for the following the next thirty minutes or so. Cool. So, uh, what was the trip you guys were talking about early, like? Wait, wait, wait. Can no I, spoilers, no spoilers. I want, to you. I want to interrupt you for one second because I need to tell everyone what I'm doing in Penang right now and I'm really excited about it. Well, first of all, we're, we're herping. I mean, you know, Stephen's actually going to come up and join me in a, in a day or so, or tomorrow. Tomorrow, Stephen, why aren't yes. you driving up tomorrow. here? <laughs> 6 a.m. You mean, 
why are you still at home? No. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm actually in Penang right now. And this is the second attempt that I've come here to try and find this subject. And what I'm looking for is a trapdoor spider called the Fistius de Soltor. Ooh. And this is an amazing trapdoor spider. I, I wish I could find a picture of it for you. But like, if you search for it, it's this beautiful red trapdoor spider. And it's endemic to Penang. It only lives here. And I came here before previously and spent three days just walking around. I didn't really know what I was doing, but you know, I, I gave it a pretty good go. And so hopefully in the near the next week or two, if I find a picture, it's going to go straight on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, it's a beautiful spider. It's really, really it's okay. Uh, bring bring Steven with you. He's gonna find it. Yeah. Oh, Steven's got all the hookups here. So um, you know, <laughs> if he if he he, me, and this other guy here can't find it, then uh it, it's it's probably extinct by now but no <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that <laughs> is it related to the purple tiger uh Terence? oh uh no no because actually yeah it's a trapdoor spider so they're in a separate genus they're actually a very primitive form of spider um so trapdoor spiders are are part of the lephistids or lephistidae and they're actually so primitive they have plates on their abdomen if you go on my instagram you can find a picture of lephistius uh, malayanus and you can actually, I have a picture where it shows like the uh, chitin plates on its abdomen. And that's a really primitive feature only found in trapdoor spiders uh, because they share a common ancestor with scorpions. So if you think of a scorpion's tail, how it has like all those segments. And then when the common ancestor of uh, scorpions and spiders evolved into scorpions and spiders, spiders like lost those plates. But trapdoor spiders are so primitive. They actually, some of the species like Lephistius de Soltor and uh, Lephistius uh, malayanus uh, still have it so um it's there it's a really fascinating uh <clears throat> relic of the past wait if it has those uh scales i i call mm -hmm. them scales at the bottom yeah do they also have that uh the reproductive organ from scorpions those things that look like feathers oh oh gosh that's a really good question um no they no that yeah, I actually know what those, I know what the feathers you're talking about. I, I don't know what the, the scientific name for them, but they don't have those now. Uh, I think they reproduce like, like how most other spiders do. Although actually, now that I think about it, because they're actually part kind of more related to megalomorphs. So they, they might do the, the sperm packet in a web like technique rather than the, the pedipalps. I'd have to think about that actually. Yeah, that's a really good question. They, they don't have those feather structures though. Uh, like what sort of level of venom are we talking about here when it comes to these trapdoors? Gosh, I, you know, I don't know. And you know, you mm. can pretty much apply that to almost every spider in Malaysia. Um, mm. There's there's so little research done Ooh. on spider venom that um, we only know about it if someone, if, if it starts to become a problem. So Ooh. for instance, I saw a talk um, not too long ago about like, you know, uh, brown widow spiders. Uh, so brown widow spiders actually do have like, um, it's not deadly, but it will like rot the flesh around, you know, the wounds that you get. So definitely don't want to get bitten by them, but almost no research is done on them. So we really have no idea, which makes me want to, makes me think like maybe not getting bit by any of these spiders because there's no telling what's going to come out. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, uh, it doesn't seem to be that big a problem. So mm -hmm. um, I've even, I've handled a few like, orb weaver spiders and they don't seem like they're gonna you know they don't seem very bitey to me so mm -hmm. uh, probably probably best not to get bitten by tarantulas though like it sounds like um well actually old world tarantulas are are really aggressive uh so a, a lot of the, the tarantulas in southeast asia are like really quick to bite you whereas mm -hmm. like stuff in in the americas are a lot more chilled out mm -hmm. uh, and I do know that like the Singapore sling, I actually looked into getting a tarantula at one point, but they live too long for me. It's like, I don't want to have to buy cricket. I don't have to buy crickets for 20 years. Like good grief guys. You know, I like mm. praying mantises. It's like, you know, you have them for like five months and then you're done. You know, and you can, mm -hmm. you don't have, you don't have to gross out your date by, you know, showing them your praying mantis. Um, which is something I'm trying to help. I'm trying to get people to stop being grossed out by these things. They're actually really stunning. Mm. especially the the diversity in malaysia but yeah mm -hmm. my praying mantis just escaped the other day got, oh no i'm, I'm oh, really sad <laughs> but i opened the cabin and was like, oh wait where is it no 
<laughs> um, oh. oh man, where is he? The gecko in your room is gonna have a tasty treat, I guess. Oh, there's no oh, gecko no. in my house because I have a cat and he oh, no. he does ah. massacres every night. <laughs> ah. How about brown beetles? Um, gold uh, Roy has a question. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, yep. uh, go ahead. Uh, he asked, "How about brown widows? Are there red widows and brown widows?" Um, uh, gosh, now I'm trying to remember. It was just a talk that I saw recently, um, and they're only over in Saba, from what I understand. Ooh. And the the people that got bit only got bit because they were living in their mining helmets or something, and then they put the helmet on. And then so just check your check your hat before you put it on if you're in Saba, apparently. And then um, keep an eye on that. But, you know, actually, on, on that note, um, talking about, like, the SIG for entomology, you know, watching the entomology talks that I did see in the last year, um, you know, it's like they're focused on, and it's, it is interesting, but a lot of the talks were, like, focused on, like, oh, this inse insect is a pest. How do we get rid of it? Or, you know, oh, there's these spiders, and these are the dangerous ones, and these are the ones that you have to be careful of, and here's how to avoid them. And I just feel like there's there's like so much more to see. There's so much more like they have such fascinating like life cycles. Like parasitic wasps in Malaysia are like incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a picture on my Instagram of um, a spitting spider carrying an egg sac, and it's been parasitized mm -hmm. by a a wasp that I ID'd as an Idris wasp, and. Uh, you know, I like looking it up. It was actually Idris wasps normally only parasitize like the eggs of stink bugs, and so for them to then go go after a spider's eggs uh, is really uncommon, and it must have been a very specific species. Um, you know, there's so much to entomology that like I think barely gets talked about or mentioned, and uh, I think there's a lot that uh, we can bring to the to like the the wider public that's uh, going to be really interesting. So I hope it takes off. Oh man, so many cool stories I find in entomology. And like, honestly, just, just going out and doing macro, um, you know, you see so much stuff that you only figure out like months later, like what you were actually looking at. Or I remember taking some pictures of uh, bark lice on the side of a tree. They're just like these really boring red, but bright red bugs. And like later on, I was like zooming in and I saw there was actually a wasp parasitizing those bark lice. So like Ooh. zooming in, you actually saw it. Like I somehow managed to just capture it happening uh, in the moment. And um, yeah, they're all over the place and they have like such incredibly complex lifestyles. Um, you know, I love herps too, but like, you know, honestly, like there's, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a hugely undervalued, um, you know, stories going on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Roy, you talk about uh, bat flies. Uh, what, what kind of flies, sorry? Uh, the fly that uh, they, li they live on bats, but they've evolved not to have wings. So now, mm. now when people want to identify the lineage of a specific bat species with one another, they can actually mm. test the bat flies because the bat flies can't fly. So they only mingle with mother and child. So they can only, a, a child can only get that fly from its mother. So now they can identify the the species correlation between bats by their flies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man, I forgot about those. They, yeah, that was, I read an article about them. It was really interesting. Um, yeah, no, that's super cool. <laughs> I'm gonna, now I'm gonna check that out tomorrow. Just curious, uh, Roy, like uh, how does your, mm -hmm. like, uh, your, your, right now your job occupation currently is, um, what was it, uh, something, something, uh, uh, geologist? Geologist, yeah, yeah. Oh, how does that, how does your profession as a geologist apply to your uh, enthusiasm for entomology and animals in general? Does it? You know, uh, the funny thing about geologists is like the older we get, the more the more kind of like, you know, kind of obscure our knowledge gets. Like if you ever mm. actually talk to like older geologists, like they they're super eccentric. Like they have like wild hair, which you can see I'm starting to grow after I get <laughs> locked down. Um, you know, all the geologists I've ever worked with who are like over 50, like they have like, like so much knowledge about all kinds of like really random things. It's like they've read the entirety of Wikipedia mm. and um, we're, we're just naturally very curious people. 
And um, I think I was actually originally, I wanted to be like a biologist when I was in, doing my A-levels in the UK. And, uh, but I flunked out so hard, they wouldn't let me back in. Like, luckily I switched over to geology, which is much more profitable. And um, <laughs> I, feel, I feel attacked. You feel that, everybody? <laughs> luckily, luckily, I got onto that train before, before that. I well, definitely right feel attacked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my apologies. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, like, um, you know, geology is really just like naturalism, but applied to rocks. And I think um, at, at my heart, the, the reality is I'm just I'm, I, I describe myself as a naturalist. You know, I'm just an mm -hmm. avid naturalist. And yeah, I'm, I'm also interested in like herbs. I'm, I'm interested in, in plants. I'm interested in all of these <clears> things. Uh, but rock, the rock, you know, the kind of natural earth system was the most profitable. So I had to learn about that first. You know, so it's good. Mm -hmm. Do you mm. still have dreams about going on into biology as a profession? Um, yeah, I think like once I win the lottery and, you know, I've, I've already like <laughs> bought like my mansion. And yeah, when you I can live probably, off the grid. And, and then like... maybe maybe I win a couple more lotteries and I can I can pay for Malaysia, my second home. Um, you know, maybe, <laughs> then, maybe maybe then I could just pursue it as a hobby and actually you know what one one interesting thing is i was doing research onto a genus of spider called hamataliwa and they they're they're such a cool genus of spider they have such a hilariously dopey looking face um and there's a lot of species in malaysia and they're they're like super chill like every time i take pictures of them they just kind of look at me like like what is this guy doing i i really mm. you have to you have to like google them they're, they're so funny looking um and, you know, I looked it up and it was like hardly any of them.